Our guest today is the president and CEO of Skills for Chicagoland's Future. Her mission is, and I quote, to close the workforce skills gap, drive business growth, and help unemployed Cook County residents return to work, unquote. Most recently, our guest today launched and served as founding president of Chicago Career, Chicago Career Tech, a career retraining initiative for unemployed emerging and middle income Chicagoans. She earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois and her master's degree in public policy from the University of Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, Marie Trupec Lynch. Marie? Hi there. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. It's so nice to look around this room and see so many people interested in the topic of unemployment and to see those of you who may not know about it um, have an opportunity to be a part of being a part of the solution today. It's really an honor. Um, I'm really struck by the people here today, so thank you. Um, I wanted to start by acknowledging a few key supporters who are partners of Skills for Chicagoland's future and, and without which we wouldn't be where we are today. Uh, Glenn Tilton was acknowledged, but it's important to note as our chair of our board, our, our second chair of our board, who's an extraordinary asset to us and really connecting us to the economic growth plan at World Business Chicago and really bringing these two together. So thank you, Glenn. Uh, we also have some additional board members here. Kelly Greer from Ernst & Young. Kelly. So there you are, um, who's also our finance and audit chair, Biff Bowman from Northern Trust, and Shelly Stern from Microsoft, who's back there. Thanks, Shelly. Um, also important to note that we have some key funders. Anybody who's in the not-for-profit world would know that if without these funders, we, we wouldn't be able to talk about this work. Uh, big, important funder for us is Karen Tor Norrington Reeves from the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. Thank you, Karen. Therese McMahon from State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. I saw Therese. There you are. Thank you, Therese, who's been a long supporter of our work, um, and thank you for that. And then Gillian Darlow from um, Polk Brothers Foundation and Beverly Meek from J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. So thank you so much. I also have some close family and friends that are here today, including my husband, John Lynch. <laughs> My mother-in-law, Linda Lynch, and my sister-in-law, Laura Lynch. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, my 12-year-old, Jack Lynch, who's um, part of the slideshow. You'll see that uh, he took our animations and may have took them to another level because he loves that. So um, I'm not sure if my marketing team loves that, but I think it's a great thing to involve the kids. Um, so you'll have to tell me later, and we'll, if you see him, tell me he did a good job. Um, and then, of course, I want to acknowledge our staff at Skills for Chicagoland's Future. If you all could stand up. We are a, um, we are a small and lean um, but really tough team that's worked really hard together. And I want to do a special shout out for our recruiters. Uh, the talent acquisition team, if you could stand back up, because you are the lifeblood of our work, and I really thank you for our, thank you. There they are, they're over there as well, thank you. So thank you for that. I am here today to discuss a very important and relevant issue, unemployment, and solutions to address it. I'm going to try to make this a really sexy topic, um, so stay with me. It's really important to me, and I'm passionate about it, but hopefully you will be at the end as well. I hope that by the end of this, this conversation today that you might have a different perspective on the unemployed, as well as walk away inspired to engage your company and your neighbors in addressing long-term unemployment in a different way than you may have come in today. But we, before we dive into this, I want to start by painting a picture for you of what being unemployed actually means. First, let's try to feel for a moment what it's like to be unemployed. When you arrived at your table today, what was the first thing you did? You probably extended a hand, you gave your name, you said what company you were with. Now imagine if you didn't have that company name to share. 
how you stumble over that, how it makes you feel. Can you imagine doing that over and over, day after day, and month after month, year after year, at, at professional events like this, at summer barbecues, maybe at church, maybe at your child's soccer game? It's difficult, it's humbling, it's demoralizing, and it affects one's self-confidence. If you've known anybody who's gone through this, you can probably relate to what that feels like. Essentially, unemployment has robbed professionals of a significant part of their identity that they'd had for so many years. Hearing the news that you're losing your job can be emotionally devastating, particularly when it happens for no fault of your own, purely because of economic conditions or changing business conditions. One of the unemployed job seekers that we have helped, Janet Cabe, worked for IT for 15 years until she was laid off in 2008. She described being unemployed as the worst culture shock imaginable. It's important to remember that most of these individuals have not chosen this path. And of course, the trauma of sharing this information with others, a difficult conversation that increases the stress level with your family and your kids. How do you tell people you've lost your job? Some people, unfortunately, won't even tell people making their job search even more difficult. I've seen this firsthand too many times, both with the people we serve and truly the people in our own social circle. We have good friends that we see on a weekly basis that know what I do for my job, and it took them six months for their wife to tell me on the quiet that her husband had been unemployed for six months. Now, can you imagine what that's like for others who have the pride and fear of telling people that they're unemployed, and yet that's the, way, the only way to get back to work? So this is part of the problem of the stigma of being unemployed. It's real and we see it, we hear it. The unemployed share with us that they have years of experience and their quandary is that they're overqualified for positions. They're willing to make the switch, they're willing to try new jobs, but unfortunately oftentimes it's not valued or the employer worries about that and they're passed over. It's an unfair bias and one that has unemployed go out of their way to try to prepare answers for. While many unemployed have told us that they never expected it to last this long and that they thought their severance package would last more than long enough, the unemployed have never faced this type of economy. They soon realize that many things soon disappear. Salary and health care benefits are gone. The luxuries go away, things we take for granted on a daily basis, paying for your kids' sports activities, maybe throwing a family party, then rent, Mortgage, car payments become difficult to the point you can't pay for them anymore. And finally, when it goes on, groceries, clothing, medication all go away. Gregory Merity, 55 years old with 30 years of work experience, described the day he went to pick up his link card at the Department of Human Services as one of the worst days of his life. And it wasn't because he went to the Department of Human Services for the state people in the room. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> So I've spoken with unemployed who we've placed, and this is true, I've been doing this for five years, who could not pay for the asthma treatments for their kids. We've talked to others who've had to move out of their homes, others who've told us about having to move to a location where all of a sudden the police tape was up because that's where they could afford to live. Some unemployed professionals quickly burned through their emergency fund, even if they had one in the first place. And they were previously working full-time jobs, and now they've become part of the underemployed, those working part-time jobs at positions simply to try to make ends meet while they wait for that next full-time position. Even as one adjusts to this devastating new circumstance, unemployed job seekers have to quickly s s move into action, perhaps seeking out unemployment insurance and other benefits for which they may be eligible for, creating or updated resumes, and adjusting to a new reality, this thing called online job searching. When speaking to an unemployed job candidate in my office last week, I asked her if there was anything she'd want me to share today. She said, 16 years, and put her hands out like this. I said, tell me more, and she said, I have not looked for a job in 16 years. This is the first time I've interviewed in 16 years. I am so nervous. These are people that never expected to be looking for a job. Imagine how nerve-wracking that is. And while technology has made it increasingly easier to apply for jobs online, 
only approximately 10% of job seekers find employment through online applications, compared to 75% that find it through networking or personal friends. Another study estimates that there is one job for every 1,700 resumes submitted. So think about when you've talked to people who are looking for jobs, where they spend their time online. And yet the data tells us that 75% of the jobs are found through networking. But more importantly, what if that job seeker does not have the right network to find employment? I recall a heated conversation I had with an old running partner of mine. We spent a lot of miles out there together, so we get into some pretty deep topics. And she shared with me that not only did she think people were taking the easy way out by simply collecting an unemployment check, but her proof was that her spouse was unemployed, and it only took him a few months to get back to work. I pointed out to her that her spouse found this new job through another PTA president who was CEO of a company and lived close to her house. This is an example of invisible privilege, a set of privileges one experiences simply because of their zip code. I asked her, what happens to all the unemployed who don't have CEOs who live next door? What about the unemployed who don't have a built-in network based simply on their address? What happens to them? So now that we can feel that and imagine that at an individual level and connect with what that means, let's look at unemployment at a macro level. Unemployment has become a top of mind domestic concern for our country's and city's leaders. We can't get through a news day without reading or hearing a story about unemployment and job growth. And it's every day at this point, it's in the news. Even the stock market, the stock market is impacted on the first Friday of every month as the unemployment numbers are released. And while the United States unemployment rate has slowly decreased over the past few years, it is still far from where it should be. And Jay, I feel like I'm stealing from you because you know these numbers. I have the expert in the room from the state. But 7.3% in August 2013 compared to 4.6% in August 2008. That is a lot of people. There is also a broader impact of being unemployed. While one struggles to look for a job, they're not spending as much money, they may be receiving unemployment benefits, and may even require some government assistance. Multiply this decrease in economic and philanthropic activity resulting from one's unemployment by the hundreds of thousands in the Chicago region and the millions in the nation who are unemployed, add in the cost of providing unemployment compensation and related benefits to these individuals, and consider the impact on our local, region, and national economies. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that $94 billion was spent in federal and state spending in unemployment in 2012. This compares to $33 billion that was spent on unemployment in 2007. And that does not even account for all the government services or the lost taxes that are associated with this. However you cut it, however you look at it, no matter what your politics are, a high unemployment rate is a giant cost to this economy. Closer to home, the unemployment picture is unfortunately bleaker, and it's not going to be all bad news. I'm going to turn to some good stuff, by the way, when we get to the second part of this. Um, but unemployment, unfortunately, is a, it's a tough, there's not great news on this right now. Chicago has one of the highest unemployment rates of all major cities in the United States. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, as of July 2013, Chicago's unemployment rate was 11.2% putting us a full 3.5 percentage points ahead than the national average. This is not a race that we want to win. In July of 2013, Chicago ranked 315 out of 372 metro areas in terms of the most challenging unemployment rates in the country. For further definition, in July 2013, there were more than 270,000 unemployed in Cook County. Karen knows this. Assuming an average of 35 weeks of unemployment and a median annual salary of $37,000, that amounts to approximately $6.7 billion in lost wages and associated spending just for county residents. Just think about that number. The Great Recession opened our eyes to this harsh new circumstance that many educated, hardworking citizens from every walk of life have found themselves in. The challenge has gotten so severe that the unemployed now have a new subcategory. It's called the long-term unemployed. These are citizens who've been unemployed for six months or longer. 
Nearly 40% of the unemployed in the United States have been out of work for 27 weeks or more, according to Brookings Institute. That's more than six months out of the workforce, and it's a new trend and a dramatic increase from previous economic downturns. For example, during the recession in the early 1980s, only 25% of the unemployed were without jobs for more than six months. That gives you a sense of how different this is. Matthew O'Brien from The Atlantic estimates that there are about four million long-term unemployed citizens in the United States. His August article stated, the long-term unemployed aren't much different from the other employed, with the exception of two things. One, they're actually more educated, and two, they're older. And as he, as he explains, it seems the stigma of getting laid off puts people near the back of the job lines. And once they've been stuck at the back of that line for six months, the stigma of long-term unemployment can keep someone there forever. Further, the unemployed face the challenge that the longer a person is unemployed, the less attractive they become to employers, who may assume that they have lost motivation, or their skills are deteriorated, or they simply don't want to work. Consider this sobering finding. A recent study from Rand Guyad, a scholar at the Boston Federal Reserve, who'd done a study, reported that only 4% of long-term unemployed candidates get called back for an interview, compared with 16% of short-term unemployed candidates with identical resumes and identical job experience. But here's the thing. Some of you may be shocked by this data, some of you may be familiar with this data, and some of you may even be affected by this personally. But at the end of the day, it's just too easy to package these stories away and think about unemployment as someone else's problem, or to convince yourselves or ourselves that the unemployed earn this stigma. Really? All 270,000 of them. I don't think they're the problem. I'd argue, as others have, that in this mix, there are many high-quality, hard-working, eager, and ready-to-work unemployed job seekers. And they are actually key to the solution on the other side of this equation, the needs of businesses. While we've certainly gone through the most difficult recession that most of us in this room can remember, businesses are struggling today with a different kind of problem. Some of them can't find enough good people fast enough to meet their growth plans. Some of them are reaching outside of the city or the state to find different and cheaper labor. And some of them are just looking for creative solutions and alternative staffing models to fill their giant needs. And then there's the skills gap resulting in a large number of skilled and semi-skilled jobs that continue to go unfilled because unemployed, because companies are unable to find qualified job seekers. According to a manpower survey, 39% of US employers have reported difficulty filling currently available positions, and 48% of them cite a lack of hard skills as the reason why. Many of those who are unemployed today don't have the training to obtain the jobs necessary. In fact, the skills and jobs they had built and their, of their careers are now extinct. As an example, it is estimated that by 2020, 67% of jobs in Illinois will require a career certificate or college degree. But currently, only 43% of adults have an associate's degree. But there is a silver lining here. 81% of employers believe the US has a large enough talent pool to fill these vacancies. This just means that we need to provide them with the skills, the education, and the opportunities for those unemployed job seekers to seek these positions. There is no doubt that the business community has hiring needs and gaps. There is no doubt that growth will continue to occur. And the remainder of today's presentation is about how to best align these business hiring needs with unemployed job seekers and about what you can do to help. So what can be done for businesses and the unemployed? I'd like to take a few minutes to share the innovative solution that was born here in Chicago. First, a little context and history. In late 2010, President Obama and now US Secretary of Commerce Penny Pritzker worked with the Aspen Institute to create Skills for America's Future, a not-for-profit employer-led policy initiative that connects employers with colleges to prepare individuals for work. Secretary Pritzker had the foresight to recognize that business perspective needed to be at the table to address the skills gap. Locally, we came together here two years ago. Businesses, foundation, governments, consultants, and not-for-profit leaders to innovate. We came together to problem solve and bring business to the table. With a stubborn unemployment rate, a new mayor in office, and a small but innovative organization called Chicago Career Tech, 
the stars had aligned to do something to address jobs and unemployment differently. We created Skills for Chicagoland's Future as the vehicle for demand-driven solution to address unemployment. I recall knowing at the time that we'd hit the right spot of pushing some change when there were some tensions and uncomfortable feelings in the room. I remember thinking, if you're creating change, it makes people feel uncomfortable. And if your goal is to keep everyone happy, then you're likely maintaining the status quo. Change is hard, but change is needed. And we needed to feel uncomfortable because unemployment is uncomfortable. So we overcame the healthy tensions to create a demand-driven solution for these hiring needs, and we put business first. And in September 2012, Skills for Chicagoland's Future was launched, and Secretary Pritzker agreed to be our first local chair. So what is Skills for Chicagoland's Future, except a mouthful of words, <laughs> which I'll always, you know, I don't know who came up with that at Skills for uh, America's Future, but we have absorbed that, and it is just a lot to say. Um, so that'll be our next iteration, figure that out. But we are a public-private partnership working to close the skills gap in Cook County by securing commitments from employers to hire the unemployed that are good matches for their jobs. We then source and match high-quality, qualified unemployed job seekers with businesses that have immediate hiring needs or trained to hire plans. We begin with the demand. We ask companies, what are your hiring challenges? Where are you having difficulty filling your jobs? Where is your growth? We offer to problem solve. Our team takes the time and a true consultative approach to learn about the employer's business model and hiring challenges. We have a board of 20 engaged CEOs and chief human resource officers who have already taken the lead to address this problem both as a group and individually. And I will say in my 20 years of work, of working with different not-for-profits around this city, I truly, and I see Glenn shaking his head, it is truly extraordinary to see this group of people together where every single person is deeply engaged in providing us feedback um, and services and time and money as they move through this. While we sometimes call ourselves a retained search for the unemployed, we work with businesses on a very customized level for the specific skills or cross competencies that are necessary for each position and cross check these as we find the right matches for these people. As I always share with employers, our goal is to find them the best unemployed candidates so that we can collectively tick away at unemployment rather than simply having companies hire from another company. Hiring talent from other companies, it's expensive, it takes time to convince people to leave their current employer, and it truly doesn't do anything to affect the unemployment rate. Compare this with utilizing Skills for Chicagoland's future, where we source and screen ready-to-work ready to job seekers who are loyal and ready to start their positions quickly. We understand that employers want to hire the very best talent, so we encourage these companies to expand their sourcing strategies to work with us to let us find some of the very best talent from the unemployed population. This is the paradigm shift we're trying to create, and it makes sense. We are often asked, where do we fit with the local workforce system? First, we are deeply honored to be a part of and work with the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. Thank you to those of you. And the many agencies that do the heavy lifting of case management and training to get individuals job ready. We complement and enhance the crucial role of the local system that focuses on job search skills and training for many unemployed individuals. We do not want to replicate that. There's a, a lot of work already being done in that space. Our role is to work with the companies to get the commitments to hire the unemployed and to identify the best candidates available for those positions. Our recruitment efforts don't stop with the workforce system. While there are a number of job seekers attached to the workforce system, there are many unemployed who do not, do not receive services from the system. They are in our target market, and we seek to identify them. We're able to, we are able to serve the full 270,000 unemployed through sourcing strategies targeted for each client's individual needs. We reach out to the underemployed, veterans, college graduates, and underemployed who may have given up hope. Behind me, you can see the list of some of the sourcing strategies we use to find the unemployed. And you should know that we design a customized sourcing strategy for every single position that we work with. Because of this reach, it's a smart strategy for businesses to partner with Skills for Chicagoland's Future to source qualified, unemployed workers to fill their open positions. In addition to helping them access and pre-screen highly motivated job seekers, we can provide our recruitment, placement, and training coordination services at no cost. 
We become an extension of a business's human resources department and administer testing and screening and preparation in a similar fashion so that by the time the candidates we present get to the business hiring managers, they've already been through the heavy lifting and are seeing a qualified group. Additionally, thanks to government workforce funding, we can reimburse an employers a percentage of their training costs. We do this because it's good for all of us. So one year ago, when we publicly launched Skills for Chicagoland's Future, it was questioned if putting the needs of employers at the front of the equation of getting the unemployed back to work would engineer positive results. Well, I'm here to tell you today that yes, it is indeed possible, and we have witnessed it firsthand. Last January, over 20 companies agreed to work with us and made commitments to hire 750 unemployed job seekers. We have surpassed the midpoint and have placed nearly 400 unemployed job seekers to date. Each month gets stronger and stronger, and the longer that we work with companies, the better our collective results. Whether it be increasing the percentage of candidates that our companies hire from us, or putting together a customized training plan that works particularly for that company, the value proposition for companies grows the more we learn about their needs. Here's what else we've learned. While some companies may initially agree to work with us because of civic responsibility or a personal connection to the unemployed, it is the business value, the economic value of what we're doing, of providing high quality talent that makes for a satisfied business client. And further, this is what leads to repeat business and a sustainable program. Companies that have exhausted other options or are looking for creative or alternative staffing solutions have recognized that there is an efficiency in finding and training great talent amongst the unemployed. And when the companies hire these individuals, it provides the evidence that there are many strong unemployed candidates who simply need skills for Chicagoland's future to be their network, to get a resume in front of the right person. I'm often reminded, Mary Sue happens to be here, but I'm often reminded of, uh, I grew up in a middle class, uh, blue collar community and always had an interest in working in government. My neighbors were air conditioning individuals, plumbers, I didn't have a network to get me that kind of a job. And I'll never forget, I found out about the internship through Mary Sue's office, not even through my graduate school, but it was the first time in my life a network had happened, luck had happened, and my neighbor was another policy student whose friend had just turned down the internship. It was an extraordinary moment that I'd been waiting for a lot of my um, young career, and it's something that always stays with me in terms of the work I do today, of remembering how that luck, how that 75% is so relevant. And I'm sure many of you here have similar stories about how you received your last uh, opening or introduction to the, the place you work. Employers want and need to find solutions for their hiring gaps, and in Chicago, they've stepped forward with funding solutions, committing to hire, providing pro bono services, and candidly sharing what works and what does not. Along the way, we found some things that employers don't want. They don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to do anything that reduces their talent pool. And they don't want to do anything that takes more time or costs more money. A company's growth is dependent on the quality of its workforce, so there should be no surprises that they would not want to do anything that deteriorates the space and we shouldn't ask them to do so. Instead of me talking in generalities, let me share a few examples of some local companies of what they've done to grow their business while addressing unemployment with skills for Chicagoland's future. Let me start with Seton Corp and their CEO, Patrick Burrell. Patrick's now an active skills for Chicagoland's future board member, but at the time, he was just a client of ours. Seton Corp is an international staffing and recruiting firm based in Chicago and has made a commitment to Mayor Emanuel to hire 400 Chicagoans. After an initial commitment to hire 100 of these 400 through us, Seton Corp quickly increased this pledge to 170 earlier this year after seeing tremendous success with the initial hires. As a result of our swift response, we have filled a total of 166 positions to date, and you know we're going to go back to Patrick and see how many more we can get for next year. There are also employers who have gone above and beyond to partner in ways that we never dreamed of when we launched a year ago. For example, United Airlines and their Chief Human Resource Officer, Resource Officer Mike Bonds and his team made a commitment to hire 100 unemployed candidates. We've already filled 20 through them, but they've done something really interesting. They've helped us craft the design of dedicated hiring days at our, at our office where their hiring managers hire on the spot. 
They've highlighted our partnership on their United website, and they've gone so far as to create a one-of-a-kind referral program where any individuals that apply for jobs at United and don't receive a position are outwardly referred to us. Uh, they opt in to be a part of that, and we're actually getting job seekers through United's creative idea on this. And there are employers who will commit to hire, share their HR practices with a trusted partner like us, and train candidates and hire them upon completion. One of them is Go Health. And Brandon is here today from Go Health. Brandon, if you put your hand up. Go Health is a health insurance technology platform working with over 100 health insurance carriers and more than 10,000 licensed agents across the United States. On a self proclaimed supersonic hiring spree, which was music to our ears, Go Health made a commitment to hire 200 unemployed job seekers through Skills for Chicagoland's future. To date, they've hired 80. Our team is busy filling more. I'm sorry, Brandon, that they're here not working on that. We'll send them back. Um, they have a big October 1st deadline, so we're feeling the heat. Um, and we're moving quickly with them hiring. At this point, we've gotten into their HR practices so well that 85% of the candidates we present to them, they hire. It also takes us between eight and 10 business days to get through the full process because we've become such an extension of their team and there's a train to hire component of the work as well. What is the impact of this? Surely you can ask Brandon and the Go Health team. I think they would tell you that we are a cost effective and creative solution that is a key part of their hiring team. I also always remember my first meeting with Brandon when we came over to talk about our work and he asked me a really important question, I don't know if you remember this, where he said, it sounds too good to be true. What's the catch? Um, we've thought about that a long time. We've thought about different answers of how we would answer that today. Um, and we told him at the time, and I would say today as well, there is no catch. It's just good business. It's a really creative solution to working with businesses to identify a set of candidates that you may not have looked for. The only catch we ask for is just that employers commit and work with us and actually do what they've agreed to do, which is to interview the candidates. Finally, I want to close out these examples by focusing on an important client of ours, SPR Companies, who is here today. Where's SPR? Where are you sitting? There they are. There's that whole team over there. The company, which provides Fortune 1000 and mid-market companies with technology, technology solutions and talent, was innovative and put together its own train-to-hire program that they designed and taught. After completing a 12-week project-based training program, the training associates became certified software testers or certified associates in software testing. You see their picture up here, and there's a number of them sitting at that table. I'm always struck by this picture. I hope what you see in this picture is one of the things that I see, which is a really diverse range of individuals who uh, had a lot of skills and went back to uh, get a specific set of training experiences to get new jobs. But it's really extraordinary, the range, the age range, the, um, the backgrounds of these individuals. And it's really a testament to the work of SPR that's been so innovative in this space. There's also many more extraordinary business partners, such as Senate, J.P. Morgan Chase, CDW, McDonald's, and Northwestern Hospital, among many others. And let's give a round to give a round of applause to all these companies that have really stepped up and hired the unemployed. These few examples prove that understanding the employer's needs and developing a customized strategy to find the right unemployed works. Skills for Chicagoland's future works. We're growing and our results in Chicago have started to attract some interest. The White House has taken notice of our work and this past summer we were invited along with a few leading employer partners to the table in Washington. As subject matter experts in the area of demand driven solutions and we've continued to work with President Obama's staff as they continue to examine solutions for long-term unemployment. The demand-driven approach has also been appealing to other organizations as well, and we will soon announce our first replication of the skills model in another Midwest city, which we are quite excited about. You can't ask me any questions about that one, <laughs> but we're really excited about that. That'll be coming this fall. We're also honored to engage at the national level while keeping our focus here in Chicago. Today, we are thrilled to formally announce an expansion of our services here. The mayor's office of the city of Chicago has stepped up again 
with the Department of Aviation and today announced a $1.6 million grant to Skills for Chicagoland's Future to help find to help find positions for individuals who could work with companies that are affiliated with O'Hare Airport. What a creative solution. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say how struck I've been by the creativity of the city of Chicago in thinking about innovative ways to really tackle this issue um, and to really identify ways to address long-term unemployment. But let's talk a little bit about what can be done in this room. In the five years that I've been in this space, I have to tell you, I've never walked in a company and had somebody say to us, I am so glad you are here. We were just talking about how we needed to hire unemployed. Right? The fact we giggle tells us how, how funny that feels. But I want to contrast that with two other really important initiatives that HR practitioners do say to us or um, community relations people do say to us, which is, great, we have a veterans hiring initiative or we have a diversity hiring initiative. Can you help us with that? But I want to push us to think a little harder and think about if there's a way that a year from now we don't laugh when we say that that it actually is something that we think about as employers, and that when Skills for Chicagoland's Future walks in the room, when Karen's organization walks in the room, when Jay walks in the room, that you're, they're actually seeking out to us and saying, we really want to do something in the space, and we want to be with you to do this. We're trying to create this focus, and the White House is interested as well. And let me give you a preview of what I recently shared with President Obama and his staff regarding what can be done nationally to address long-term unemployment. And I'll tell you, this is not a dream. This is based on what I've seen employers do here in Chicago and what I think more employers can do. So if you're an organization that hires, hires people, whether you're a not-for-profit or whether you're a for-profit business, you can do the following things. First, you can make a public commitment to hire the unemployed and promote this within your company. You can set a goal of a number or a percentage or a time frame. By setting this goal, it really drives practice into the organization and allows us a number to work off together to try to get unemployed at your company. You can second, you can partner with Skills for Chicagoland's Future to source qualified unemployed candidates for your hiring needs. We don't expect you to do this alone and to find the unemployed. That's what we're here for as well as many of our partners. Commit to review these resumes and commit to interview these candidates. Third. You can adopt, utilize, and promote internal policies that ensure that the long-term unemployed are welcome and not overlooked in your sourcing strategy. For example, you might be surprised. If you talk to members of your team, you might find out that your applicant tracking system is actually designed in a way that candidates who don't have jobs are screened out and never make it to even be looked at. Fourth, you can utilize training funding to hire and train unemployed with skills gaps. You can create your own training program, you can modify a training program, you can work with us or others to identify partners to do so. And fifth, you can provide funding or pro bono assistance to organizations like Skills that provide demand-driven work. You can connect your company's foundation with demand-driven organizations like us. You can recommend your senior business executives for workforce and demand-driven board of director positions amongst a number of organizations in town. And local companies like Mayor Brown, Accenture, Motorola Solutions, McDonald's, Career Builder, and United have already provided valuable time and talent in the space. And the pro bono work, I have to tell you, is an extraordinary asset to what we've been able to accomplish. We are on to something here in Chicago, and I'm so proud to be a part of this work. We are honored to work with organizations involved in this critical work of reducing our unemployment rate. Our early results would not be possible without the support of generous funders whose names you see behind me. It also involves extraordinary partners like the City of Chicago, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, the team at the Illinois Department of Employment Security and City Colleges in Chicago, as well as numerous agencies around Cook County that prepare the unemployed job seekers to be job ready. We are so grateful to all these partners. When we come together, people like Gregory Merity find employment. Gregory began his career at Go Health on May 13th, and he used his first paycheck to pay for dinner with his sweetheart and his now fiance. 
People like Sharita Jackson, who was unemployed for nearly three years, applied for a position with People Scout. Thanks to her commitment to career growth as well as People Scouts, Sharita's supervisor noticed her early talent, and she's now been promoted within her fourth, fourth week of working. These are just a few examples. I wish I could share with you all of those, but you don't want to be here all day to hear those, so you can call me later and we can talk about them. But I can tell you the tears of joy, the tears of joy in their faces are extraordinary, and we get the ability to hear those phone calls, see those faces, and see those moments when people get back to work. I'm so proud of this city, and I know we have only scratched the surface. I want to put some more zeros on those numbers next time I come back, right? And you see, while I feel passionately about the need to grow our economy and reduce unemployment by addressing inv invisible privilege, it's personal for me too. I've looked in the terrified eyes of a mother who couldn't afford a new pair of shoes for the little girl who'd outgrown them. It's a look I'll never forget, and a look one sets her life's work on to make sure that we can help as many indiv individuals as possible never face that look in the mother's eyes, or at least reduce the amount of time that look is in the mom's eyes. Simply put, there are 270,000 unemployed Cook County residents experiencing this pain. And I've listened to too many stories of homes going into foreclosure and seen too many tears of, jo job, too many tears of joy of people excited about their job offer to know that this opportunity to solve this is just good for all of us. We know there are many companies in Chicago who want to grow and flourish and put people to work, and these companies can also grow their leadership and corporate responsibility to solve this problem. We just need to partner to connect the puzzle pieces of supply and demand. Your peers in this room, many companies have already solved part of this problem. I implore you to go back to your offices today and be the catalyst of change, armed with these economically-based solutions that help your company and begin working with us. I urge you to talk deeper with that person you meet at your child's athletic event, or at the train, or at church, and dig deeper when they explain that they're unemployed. Share with them what you heard today and connect them to us as a resource. Let us be their network. That is why Skills is here. Let's lock arms as we leave here today and make hiring the unemployed in Chicago the next big priority and campaign for companies and continue to lead the nation in solving this issue. Thank you so much. has done such a great job. Uh, I remember when she first started, and she's as is as passionate now as she was when we met three, four years ago? Yeah. However long ago it was. I'm going to be real quick with these questions because I know we've got a lot of things going on today. Brian, am I saying your last name right, Fabes? Yep. Um, Brian's question is, what sort of company benefits from working with skills? So I'll answer this quick. Uh, first, I'd say we, we just did an analysis on this for our board, and we've seen two things. One is uh, companies that are mid-sized, that are growing, that may not have a large enough HR department yet, where they could really take advantage of a skill set like ours, who um, also have volume hiring opportunities, is really uh, a good fit. Another is our large corporations that can identify um, a specific area that we can focus on to do some volume hiring as well. I'm not going to talk like Dr. Green does about people's writing, but I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, here's another question. Is there a plan to address the disproportionate level of unemployment for the people of color in Chicago? Hmm. Land. So, uh, you know, the way I would answer this is uh, certainly our work is reflective of this. Uh, when we look at the number of uh, unemployed that we serve and the diversity, we absolutely reflect the diversity in Chicago of, of that. Um, I am not aware, Karen may be, I'm not aware of a specific plan regards to race. Um, at this point, I think we're all working on just trying to deal with all the different income levels that have been affected by this. Um, so I'd say in short, there's not a specific plan, but I think based on um, um, how the percentages are falling in terms of who we're serving, it is absolutely matching those that are affected. Nina, I got your question. I think it's very similar to what to the one I just asked, so I'm going to bypass mm -hmm. that. Um, Joyce Saxon asks, Joyce is a city club. Board. Uh, well, I'm going to read it, and then you can tell me if I've read it correctly or not. Um, 
we should go back to skills training schools like Jones Commercial. I think you need to help me from there. <laughs> Yeah, so we are um, part, because of the economic growth plan for World Business Chicago, we're actually partnered with Chicago Public Schools, as well as City Colleges, as well as the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership, that is actually all collectively focused on that, which is um, skills training for those individuals that may not be interested in college. Um, you know, all the, you're all reading the same things I'm reading right now, it's definitely an issue. And I think with the vocational ed program at Chicago Public Schools is one approach on this. City Colleges is certainly doing this as well. So I think it's definitely top of mind and it's where I'm seeing the energy um, being focused on. <laughs> 